Hello and welcome to the Methodist Podcast, published on the 13th of August, 2020. This week we review the year of the outgoing Methodist Youth President, Thelma Comey. We hear about the role of the climate change campaign workers, learn about Coffee Shop Sunday, and we sing A Million Dreams. But first, I'm sure you will have heard news of the devastating explosion that occurred in Beirut last week, causing widespread casualties and catastrophic damage to homes, hospitals and other buildings throughout the area. All we can, the Methodist Relief and Development Movement, has launched an emergency appeal to help support those in greatest need. And on the line with me is the Chief Executive of All We Can, Graham Hodge. Graham, we often see all we can responding to natural disasters. What's the situation in Beirut that requires our help? The disaster that we have um, in Beirut at the moment is really very catastrophic. When we picture it as a as an area that's affected, if we overlay that, for example, across a, a map of London and that explosion had happened in the centre of London, we would be looking at a radius of around 24 kilometres from the centre of London. So I live in South London, about 12 miles as the crow flies. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty much talking about the whole of the area inside the M25 that's been affected, and certainly that inner circle. And that kind of scale of destruction, I think, demands all of our attention, especially in a context like Beirut, where um, instability, hunger, um, recession, COVID cases, etc., has compounded to make a very difficult circumstance anyway. Um, and a huge number of people, 220 people have already been reported dead, uh, 6,000 people injured, and uh, still many more missing, and up to 300,000 people are effectively being made homeless as a result of this. Do we know how the money that's raised is going to be used? Absolutely. The, the All We Can response um, really will be responding through a local partner to reach uh, those most in need. Um, it'll be an emergency response tending to immediate humanitarian needs like food, water, shelter, health care, those kind of things which won't otherwise be able to be provided by the state in that situation given the fragile nature. So it really is the most emergent needs of the people in Beirut that we'll be responding to. And, uh, and, and it's so important that people get help at this critical time. And how can people donate to the appeal? People have been so generous already and we're so grateful for the support of the Methodist uh, people, especially to this uh, response that we're coordinating on behalf of the Methodist Church. Um, but we do need more given the scale of the disaster. And so people can donate directly at the website at allwecan.org.uk forward slash Beirut or call 020-7467-5132. That's 020-7467-5132 or allwecan.org.uk forward slash Beirut. The Methodist Youth President, Thelma Comey, is coming to the end of her year in office. So before she goes, I decided it would be good to catch up with her for a chat. I began by asking Thelma how she felt back in 2018 when she was elected at 3 Generate in Southport. I was nervous, excited, scared, happy, and terrified. <laughs> um, not quite sure what to expect. Um, I had never seen Methodism on a connectional level, but I was so excited to uh, be given the opportunity to serve as youth president and to do this uh, for a year. So I, I think it was a whole pool of emotions when I first got voted in. And has the role been what you expected it to be? No. <laughs> I didn't really know what to expect. I think that's the beauty of this role, that um, to represent young people could be interpreted in so many different ways. So there's no one size fits all for any youth president. Um, but I think it turned out to be so much better um, and so much more exciting and so many more opportunities than I could have ever imagined a year ago. Out of the whole year, what have the highlights been for you? I think the best part about my year is actually the end bit of it now and being able to look back and see uh, how I've changed and all of all that I've been able to bring to the Methodist Church and what the church has given to me. Um, I loved to regenerate and meeting thousands of young people. That would be a privilege that I could never uh, trade for anything. What about the challenges? What stretched you during your year? Uh, yeah, it does come with a lot of challenges. I think if anybody knows me, they'll know I am very much so an introvert and this role doesn't render itself to that type of personality too strongly because you are constantly meeting new people and constantly having to interact so I think a challenge has been uh, balancing just like you know taking care of myself while 
having such a fast paced year. Another challenge has been, uh, I mean, in this world, you're exposed to so many types of people and so many people have different beliefs and expressions of faith. So how do you uh, represent and engage with people that you don't necessarily agree with? Um, which has been challenging as a youth president. So I've had to count on God for some divine wisdom to know what to say and when to say it and how to say it um, to keep God's love in the centre of everything I do. Given that you admit to being a bit of an introvert, you've been getting an awful lot of media attention. You've been on Songs of Praise, a regular contributor for Pause for Thought on BBC Radio 2, and of course numerous radio interviews. You've become a, a bit of a celebrity, haven't you? <laughs> celebrity is a strong word. <laughs> It's been so exciting. I think the media aspect of this role has been one of my favourite parts. I have actually really enjoyed uh, all the radio interviews that I've had and all the podcasts that we've done together and all of, I mean, songs of praise. Yes, please. <laughs> that was very exciting. So um, I look forward to continue engaging with Christian media um, and contributing in that way. How do you think your faith has changed over the year? You've been totally immersed in the work of the church and you've seen how it works behind the scenes, so to speak. Has that changed your relationship with the church? Yeah, it really has. Um, I think I know my church a whole lot better, I can tell you that, <laughs> um, now that I've peeked behind the curtain. Um, and I think this year has strengthened my faith because it's made me um, know a lot more about what's out there in terms of how people express their faith. And it's made me want to grow in what I believe I think for a lot of it has pushed me you know to actually open my bible and read and get to know um who God really is for myself so I think it's been it's actually deep in my roots and it's made me appreciate the church a whole lot more um, and learn from so many just life stories of the connectional team there's people who have been in Christians or Methodists for years upon years and just sharing in their testimony and seeing how people are passionate for God in their day-to-day -day work has been so inspirational for me as a young Christian. Obviously, apart from chatting to me once in a while, what are you going to miss about the role? <laughs> yes, uh, I think it's going to be interesting going back to school and realising my whole life doesn't involve around church anymore. <laughs> so it's going from a Monday to Sunday to just a Sunday. Um, I'm going to miss that. I'm going to miss being able to have countless daily opportunities to just talk about Jesus as a job. You know, <laughs> that's great. Um, I'm going to miss working with the connectional team dearly. I'm going to miss the children, youth and family team um, and just meeting lots and lots of young people. I think that's been just invaluable to hear the stories of young people and young Methodists and how they engage with the church. Um, I think I'm going to miss all of that. During your year in office, we had the Black Lives Matter movement. You're a young black woman of faith. How can the church take that energy forward? Yeah, I don't need to tell anybody my year has been rather eventful. <laughs> um, I've had a very unique youth presidency year. And I mean, I, I in my contribution to the Connectional magazine, I did say that my heart um, around, around those issues was not necessarily because I'm black, but more because I'm a Christian. And I think that racism in itself is a sin. It looks nothing like Jesus Christ. And as a church, we should always 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 be able to call out on the evils that exist in our time and pray for people so i think for me my my biggest prayer and i, I hope that the church is praying is that um people who have been hurt and who are filled with anger are shown the love of jesus and the people who can harbor such hatred for people are called up upon that um and and they meet jesus for themselves i think that we should be a church that that preaches the good news for what it is and the good news is both good and it also calls out the bad that is in human hearts. Um, so how do we present that in the way that we do church? And how can, how can our church look so much like the kingdom of God and just be welcoming to every culture and every colour? And not because we're black or we're white, but because we're Christians and we have the spirit of God in us. You've mentioned that you're going to be going back to school. What are your plans going to be once you've finished as youth president? Um, I'm actually looking forward to go and study pharmacy in university this year. Um, and looking forward to staying in touch with the church and seeing how I can, I can continue to serve and grow in my faith um, and keeping the relationships that I've built this year. Do you have any words of advice for the next youth president, Phoebe Parkin? I would tell her, do not accept every slice of cake you're offered.
<laughs> that is the first piece of advice I would tell her <laughs> because it will not end well for you. <laughs> um, I would also say enjoy every moment of it because it really does fly by. Uh, I would say have confidence in just who you are because the beauty of this role is it it forms to whoever you are as a person, whatever gifts you, you have to offer and whatever passions you hold. So just be confident in being Phoebe. That's all they ask you to be. Um, I would say don't be afraid to, to speak up uh, and to challenge things and to ask questions because you are just as, just as important as anybody else in that conversation. So yeah, and enjoy your year, really enjoy it. The Methodist Church has employed two young climate change campaign workers whose job it is to launch a climate justice campaign that's going to reach out across the Methodist Church and across the generations. The original plan was for Molly Pugmire and James Appleby to be working towards the COP26 Convention on Global Warming and Climate Change in Glasgow this November. Well, as with lots of events, of course, COP26 has had to be postponed until next year now. On the 22nd of August, they're organising two webinars for young people with the help of the Joint Public Issues Team, the Methodist Church's Children and Youth Team and All We Can to explore the issues for young people and help to define the project. And Molly and James are of course on the phone with me now. Hello Molly and James. Hello. Hello. Molly the job was going to be for you both to attend the COP26 summit that's taking place in Glasgow this November but but that's not happening now is it? Yeah so obviously originally when we first applied an interview for this role um, the world was pre-Covid um, and the idea was that the COP26 um, conference which is the UN's climate change conference was supposed to be happening in Glasgow this November November 2020 so part of the idea was that um, we would start the rules and we would be coming up with a campaign to mobilize the church with our eyes fixed on that point of November but obviously because of um, the pandemic that is obviously not possible now and um, so instead the conference has been moved to next um, I think next November, I think at the moment, and so that is now outside of our year-long contract. So at the moment, we're not entirely sure what involvement we'll have with the COP specifically, because beforehand we were deaf, we were going to go um, and be there. Um, whereas now we're not entirely sure what will happen with that. Um, but the idea is now instead we have more time, which I guess in many ways that's a really good thing. Instead of having only half of our year sort of before the conference and being able to after the conference maintain um, that kind of energy and enthusiasm for climate justice now we've got a full year um, so we can build something really substantial and hopefully by the time COP does roll around um, the church will be a lot more informed and passionate and excited and hopeful um, for the things that will happen in Glasgow. James, tell me about the Green Agents of Change Catalyst event that's taking place on the 22nd of August. So the Green Agents of Change um, were a sort of uh, a number of uh, young people who would signed up with the Children, Youth and Families team um, to express an interest in uh, taking action for climate justice. Um, so what we're going to be doing is uh, on the 22nd of uh, August, that's a Saturday, we're running two events. Uh, one at 10.30, which is aimed for ages 8 to 11, and one running at 3.30, uh, which is aimed 12 to 17s. Uh, they're both going to be an hour and a half, and they're both going to sort of look at um, different aspects of climate justice and what that looks like uh, within the church context. And Molly, what are the outcomes you're hoping for from the Catalyst events? Yeah, so I think a big part of the event is also just celebrating um, the fact that young people within and outside of the church have been um, already really vocal and active on issues of climate justice. So given a little bit of space, one, to celebrate um, the achievements of young people, but also to be able to connect them up with one another, because I think a lot of young people in the church, regardless of what issue you're discussing, often find that um, they might be alone in their church congregation. So a big part of what this event um, is hoping to do is connect up young people across the UK who are passionate so hopefully after the event we'll be able to find out a little bit more about what those young people want from us in the future and how they can be involved in our 
work and also the work of the upcoming new youth president, um, Phoebe Parkin, whose theme for the year encompasses this issue of climate justice and how young people can be at the forefront of um, engaging their communities in climate justice. So hopefully after the event, we'll be able to work out how we can best support these young leaders um, and activists and yeah, see what um, we can do for them and what they can do for us. With the whole world focusing on the pandemic, is there a danger that climate change could be forgotten or could everything that's happened this year be seen as some sort of opportunity? Most people, I, I think the statistics are, are showing at the moment that most people don't want to sort of return back to the way things were before the pandemic. I think a lot of people are appreciating the clearer air, um, the, the sort of clear skies and, uh, and, and all of that. Um, and so I think there is certainly uh, a good possibility that um, when we sort of go through the recovery process, the recovery plans, um, that people might start to try and actually work climate justice and climate action into that, um, because I think that is going to be sort of quite fundamental to any rebuilding process. A lot of people that I've spoken to, and myself included, have noticed that, um, especially in those early days of lockdown, when life had very much slowed down, there was a lot of time I found to reflect on the things that we do and the way that we live, and actually how so much of the busyness that comes with life is really unnecessary. And actually, we, I was able to spend a lot of time in that in um, those first couple of months, thinking a lot about the way that I live and the the harm that I do to the planet. And I think a lot of people have noticed, as James said, as the air was um, clearer, as more people were walking or taking bicycles instead of their cars. And I mean, at the moment, obviously there's a very, there's a big push for people to stay in the UK if they're going on holiday this year, as opposed to flying abroad. And um, I think, so I think this has been a time in which a conversation and a bit of time for reflection about what we do and why we do it. And if it's actually, the most sustainable thing um, has been able to happen. Um, and so, yeah, I think a lot of people are, are coming out of lockdown really considering how they live and how the choices that they make, um, which I think is, is going to be helpful for us to then have a further conversation about climate. And of course, climate change is an issue where what we do now is going to be felt by, by the generations to come, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think what's really interesting about climate justice is the way in which young people have really been at the forefront of conversations about it. Um, and I think that's fantastic and we really want to celebrate that. But I think one thing that we're really conscious of is that what we what is not going to be to um, benefit of the church is if this is only a conversation had by young people, because actually what we have observed is that change doesn't happen just by one group of people, but actually um, change happens the best and is probably most accept, accepted by society if everyone is involved and everyone is aware. Um, so a really big part of our job this year is to work out how we can start this intergenerational work in, in the church so that views and the knowledge of young people is respected, but actually that empowers and educates other people in the church so that it's the whole church who is um, being mobilised together and people aren't left behind or left confused about why it's important, but everyone can unite under one cause and work together. As we've mentioned in previous podcasts, the pandemic is of course a tragedy, but it is a chance for us to review the mission of our churches. Trevor Gay leads the evangelism and church planting team at Coventry and Nuneaton Methodist Circuit, where last December they began Coffee Shop Sunday. Hello, Trevor. Good to speak to you, Mike, yeah. Trevor, how did Coffee Shop Sunday come about? Last summer, summer of 2019, the circuit launched um, a mission pl a plan, a strategy, and that strategy had seven uh, elements, and one of them was evangelism and church planting. And myself and the um, superintendent, Marcus Torchin, we stood in the sun in this car park, in a retail park in Coventry, and I noticed a Costa Coffee shop. So I suggested we go and have a cup of coffee and a chat. And as we sat in the in Costa Coffee, I, I said to Marcus, this would be a good place for worship. And so, so that was the 
that was the uh, seed, if you like. And from that, we approached Costa Coffee management, who were just fantastic, so cooperative. And within three months, we were up and running from the 1st of December. How did you get people to come and join you at Coffee Shop Sunday? Initially, we decided that we'd meet every two weeks. So we meet at 4.30 on a Sunday in the retail park. And initially, we obviously advertised what we were doing within the circuit. And the first session, first gathering, it's fair to say that most of the people who came were people who already go to church. And we had a total of 22 people, which was good as a first week. But within about three or four gatherings, we had 57 people. And um, that's amazing. And those 57 included a number of people who were customers of Costa Coffee because the store closes at 5 p.m. And we're there from 4.30. So customers who are already there can have the option of staying on or leaving at five o'clock. And the joy is that a number of people have stayed with us. Um, we provide free coffee from our budget for anyone who wants to stay. And maybe that's one of the attractions. But uh, I'd like to think there's more to it than that. How does worship look and feel in a coffee shop? Are people comfortable worshipping in that sort of public space? Yeah, I, th I think the answer is yes. Um, I think it's different for people. Certainly people who are used to church and traditional worship. It's different. Um, and it's been amazing how some of the older and more experienced churchgoers have enjoyed it. I, I love that. Um, so it's definitely different. We have a contemporary style. It's intentionally modern. We try and use language that is non-traditional. So we don't have a sermon. We have a talk or an inter interview. We don't have hymns. We have a songs. So we try to be um, a, not a traditional hymn sandwich service. We have a keyboard player who at 4.30 will be playing ordinary music and a mixture of some Christian music. Uh, one of the lovely stories is that somebody asked him in the first couple of weeks, do you do any Tom Jones? <laughs> which, is, which is wonderful. He does do Tom Jones. Um, so so it's, it's a different approach. It's, um, and I think people are surprised who are in there as customers. I think they're intrigued. Um, some people go at five o'clock, which is fine, but a number of people have stayed, which is even better. I'm assuming the pandemic's meant that you've had to pause Coffee Shop Sunday for the moment. Yeah. Um, when when eight, middle of March came along, we were all disappointed because we'd had eight gatherings by then we meet every other Sunday and then really it was quite sad that we stopped but there we go so but we made a commitment that we would keep in touch with people which we've done through our online presence through Facebook Zoom video updates and and writing I imagine you're going to have to work very closely with Costa on how you return to coffee shop Sunday aren't you Definitely. Um, we've been in touch with Costa um, and they want us back. We, we went to see the Costa management and, and they're great. They're, they're looking forward to us being back. We can't wait, but we'll have to wait. Um, they are very much part of us and they want us back and we want to go back. Is the Costa coffee model maybe a good idea for other churches to consider when they're thinking about their, their forward planning for mission? And uh, we certainly, in our circuit, um, this is seen as our first expression of many. We've already got two coffee shops, one another Costa and one an independent coffee shop, one in Coventry, one in the Nuneaton part of the circuit, um, who are already expressing interest in doing something similar. So we've got one running, two in the pipeline and a few more to come. Our strap line, Mike, is in for Coffee Shop Sunday is meeting God in an ordinary place. And th there aren't many more ordinary places than, you know, coffee shops. Um, and, and people are there. So it's the idea is to go to where people are um, and, and give people the choice, the option of staying with us or not.
And if people walk out at five o'clock, that's not a, that's not a defeat because God will have touched them whilst they're there. Elisa Rumsby is leader at Bladen Methodist Church in Oxfordshire, where the members have put together a special performance of A Million Dreams from the musical The Greatest Showman. Um, it's one that we've sung before in concert. Um, it's one that the kids love. They're very, um, very keen on um, The Greatest Showman. So we knew it would be a hit with them. Um, and it is a good song. We all like the song. So we thought we wanted to record something um, just to connect with each other. And it's a song that we um, all felt it was our dreams and, and what we want to be doing. And hoping that soon we'd, we'd all be back together and be able to perform and sing together. It's really important that we can all get together in some form um, so they, they know they can contact us um, and also so that they know that we're still here and, and we are doing things. If we have a big junior church, we don't have a, 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 an, a, an older congregation, so it's not a traditional church in that sense. And um, we do a lot of performance. That is our USP, really. So... <laughs> So we are always working. We, we hope, we were hoping that we'd be performing um, Disney's um, The Little Mermaid this autumn. Um, that is looking, you know, highly unlikely. So now we're, we're looking at what else we can do. So we could do maybe rehearsals in bubbles and in little groups, which we can then stream or, or record. Um, you know, just looking to, to the future of, of having a, a time where we're, we're doing something slightly different but hey you know we can still do something we're still here we're going to do something it's thanks to all the all the support around us hello oliver did you enjoy making the song oh uh, yeah yeah my mum and dad helped me olivia how did you feel about taking part I've never heard my own voice without backing tracks. That was rather eye-opening, um, uh, very interesting, very different, not having other people singing with you and hearing and bouncing off other people when you're performing. So it was a very different experience, but I really, really enjoyed it. I was really proud of them all. I thought they all did a fantastic job because like the girl said, it, it was so different than um, performing on stage. Uh, because you haven't got the confidence of having your, your mates around you. Um, so they all did a, an amazing job and they, we were really, really, really pleased with the end product. And the, the kids were awesome, as they always, always are. This week's prayer is shared with us by the Reverend Helen Cameron, Chair of the Northampton Methodist District and the Ecumenical Canon of Peterborough Cathedral. O oh, Holy God, your world weeps in sorrow and we feel helpless. Yet we know that you weep too over the world that you have made and that you love. We pray for those who are most vulnerable at this time of global pandemic, those with the least resources, those with little access to medical care, those who already struggle to feed each other every day. Help us to express care for those who are imprisoned, those who are lonely, and all who die unmourned. Amen. Thank you for listening to this week's Methodist podcast and do let us know if you or your church have something you'd like us to feature. From myself, Mike Ivatt, goodbye. Goodbye.